Um, by the way, do you mind if I record this call? No problem. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for jumping on a call. Super excited to connect, and especially after you jumping on that, uh, you know, call and sharing more about your project. Super interested to both learn and figure out how we can collaborate if uh, there are some potential intersections. And um, maybe I can give you a, a quick introduction of about myself in kind of the last um, six, almost six months of, of my life now as the Corona, uh, Corona Y founder. So I come from a, a traditional venture capital background. Um, I'm an AI engineer that turned into entrepreneurship. Uh, co-founded Venture Studio here in LA. Um, I'm originally from Ukraine, so moved here uh, to to run the business and co-create startups. And for the past uh, six, seven years, I've been primarily focused on creating new businesses, pushing them to the market and validating the, the need for the product um, until COVID hit the stage. And this was the perfect moment for me to kind of reevaluate what's important to me um, in life and professional life. And I, since then, I've been uh, solely focused on Corona Y as this vehicle for impact-driven um, innovation, um, focused on open science and obviously helping medical researchers solve a pandemic. Cool, thanks. So I can tell you also a little bit about myself, if that's fine. So, yeah, I come from, um, uh, let's say, uh, computer science background, uh, but then I moved to biology. I, uh, I did my PhD in computational biology, so that's the kind of stuff I did. Uh, yeah, nothing so interesting. And then for some years, I have been working in the semantic web world. So I work uh, already since my PhD times. I, I got to use some of the vocabularies that you guys are using. Um, and then and some others, yeah, like this systems biology markup language and so on. And then I came to this company, which is called Semantic Web Company. It's a 15-year-old company that specializes, uh, it, yeah, it, it commercializes and develops and commercializes some products for managing vocabularies, basically, but also for uh, text processing stuff using semantic web technologies. And here I'm a researcher in in the company and I work both on research of uh, let's say internal stuff so prototypes and stuff like that that go into the product eventually but also in these funded projects that take uh, that the company takes part in so we participate um, at the, any given time for the last five years with the companies in some six or seven uh, funded projects both European wide funded projects and also Austrian specific funded projects were based in Vienna. Uh, and some of this stuff, uh, yeah, you can imagine text processing, semantic web, and so on, intersect a lot with what you guys have been doing <clears throat> in the Corona Y. Uh, I joined you guys, yeah, also some time ago uh, by invitation of some guy, so some guy from Gartner, whose name I don't even remember now. Uh, he's a contact of our CEO, and he somehow I said, yeah, you guys should totally participate in here. I think his name was Brandon. I don't know. We, I joined some call, we got super excited. And then we had some uh, exchanges with the people from JPL uh, mm -hmm. um, who are were doing the knowledge graph at the beginning of Corona Y. And we had a couple of calls with them. It, everything was seemed super. Uh, yeah, Luis and the uh, uh, girl. I, I can't Anna remember. Didier? Or... Uh, Didier, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, we don't have so many resources to commit. So uh, we were very quickly, uh, let's say, overrun by you guys. You guys are working at an impressive speed. Uh, and we don't have so much resources. So we were uh, trying only to catch up. So at the end, uh, things did not work. I just invited Artem. Artem Ravenko uh, is uh, the head of research at Semantic Web Company. And I think it might be interesting for him to be here because he's the, yeah, the head of research and he's the guy who has worked mostly uh, on this Q&A along with another colleague of ours, Maria, who I think at the moment is on holidays. So- awesome. And by yeah. the last name, I can, I can already tell he's from Eastern Europe. Exactly. Right? Yeah. From Ukraine, <laughs> no? Uh, 
from Russia. Artemis yeah. comes from Russia. Got it. And our other colleague, Maria Falchik, is also coming from Russia. So, uh, yeah, you guys can try. And, despite my first name, I do not come from Russia. So, please don't <laughs> speak <laughs> in Eastern European Islamic language. Oh, good. Hey. So, hi, hi, hi there. Sorry, I had some problems with my. I was not audible and I could not hear you. And I'm very sorry for being late. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, we were just uh, getting an in introductions uh, flowing in. Um, so, yeah, maybe um, Artem, I'll, I'll quickly repeat myself uh, to introduce um, who I am and what I do and the kind of the short overview of the. Um, the last six months of my life as a founder of Corona Y. So I originally, I'm an AI engineer from Ukraine, um, but since the six, seven years ago, I co-founded Venture Studio here in LA, turned into entrepreneurship, and primarily was focused on creating new businesses, pushing out startups to the market, um, until COVID stay, uh, hit the stage. And this is when I uh, started to reevaluate what's important in, in my life and kind of focused on the, the impact driven innovation and got um, kind of obsessed with this idea of open science and open source um, moving into the research and science. And yeah, super excited to, to see how we can collaborate with you guys. Um, Victor just mentioned that um, you, you guys obviously lack resources to, uh, to dedicate to these initiatives, but I truly believe that Corona Y as, as a phenomenon uh, benefits even from like 10 minutes per day um, of people's time. And some people can dedicate crazy hours. Some people can dedicate only 10 minutes per day and somehow it, it beautifully works. So super excited to, to see if we can find some inter intersection points. Cool, Thanks. cool. Sounds good. Uh, what's your story? Mine or like the company? Yeah. So, um, your... uh, I, I, my personal. Yeah. Okay. So let me uh, let me tell you. So I'm working here at Semantic Web Company. I am uh, trying to coordinate our research efforts. So where this is going, and what we would like to do. And usually we work on the basis of funded projects. I don't know. If you have experience with that, how it works in Europe, you know, it's, it's a process of like, it takes you a few months to prepare a proposal, then you wait half a year to one year to get it accepted or rejected, and then you have three years to execute the, the project. You know, so it's kind of, uh, it gets momentum and then it's difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we also try to plan resources ahead. So we are not, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm trying to motivate why we are not having this time for doing uh, such such projects as Corona Y, or why it is difficult to get this time, yeah. it's because you know we are, we are slow. We are preparing one year for doing next three years some work, and uh, then we are already planned out, and we, we don't have that many resources. So. Yeah, that uh, makes however, sense. Okay. Yeah. However, we got interested by, by the, the uh, by the Corona tasks, by the Corona ideas, and. Uh, yeah, we see it as a as a good thing. So we would like to contribute, and we've been around uh, in the in the face of Victor for uh, for some some two months, three months around. So Victor, from time to time, he he would listen, participate in and uh, uh, Corona Y telcos. However, also I think that Victor did not have many resources to spend on this. So we've kind of, uh, yeah, we're sneaking around listening to you and we try to do something useful. Uh, however, not The always. intent is there. That's the most important thing. Um, yeah, it, it's great because uh, we, we actually just reconnected with NASA people and Lewis to kick off the next round of collaboration and knowledge graph stuff. And um, I guess um, I would love to hear from your perspective because you guys are in the trenches of doing knowledge graphs, right? Like you're basically um, reacting to the, all of these uh, Horizon 2020 projects and establishing uh, kind of, um, are you working on the intersection of different organizations or are you primarily working for like one organization that uh, has a funded project? Just no, we work for Serval. So 
uh, that the funding comes from different uh, funding partners like uh, European Commission, also the Austrian Ministry of Science. And for each project, there are anywhere between two and I don't know, 15 partners. Maybe it's the largest one that we have. Art and, like Yeah, we have larger ones. We, yeah. we, we, there is one crazy project where there are less. Uh, so, uh, Satiris, how many partners are there in trusts or in shock? In shock? Yeah, thirty something. Wow! Okay. And one of the partners in shock, by the way, is Dant, so mm -hmm. the institute where Slava Tikhonov works. Yeah, uh, well, Slava is also kind of crazy about um, these mega collaborations with uh, like all the European uh, countries and governments and all of that. I unfortunately lack experience of such large scale, uh, let's say, bureaucratic collaborations. Um, I come from a, a more rapid uh, style uh, execution, but this is where Corona Y um, kind of uh, thrives because we, we have people from different environments, from different experiences jumping in and, and sharing their own way of, of doing things. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, so we're trying to create this like COVID-19 knowledge graph. And obviously there are many companies in the world trying to, to create something uh, usable and useful. And uh, you know, the, I, I'm actually very far from uh, like semantic web. And uh, even though I'm a big fan of Tim Berners-Lee and you know, uh, W3 and all, all of these um, kind of like new initiatives that he's creating was the solid interrupt and uh, more innovative ways of decentralized internet. But I, I actually, every time I look at like Sparkle queries or something like that, I just like get a stroke. It's, it's too complex. It's uh, unmanageable to an average, um, you know, uh, computer scientist. And I was wondering, how do you guys bridge that gap between uh, all the crazy semantic web things and the, the regular web. Um, let, let me ask you, which, which programming language is your primary programming language? Well, mine, it would be Node and Python. Okay, so in Python, there is RDF lib, uh, which helps you to query. So we don't use Sparkle, we use RDF lib. <laughs> it's a joke, sorry, it's a joke. But the thing is that, uh, uh, the, I, I think it's not necessary to be a world master in Sparkle to be able to use the semantic web principles, actually. There are different approaches to that. And some people do uh, even analytics in Sparkle queries. So they aggregate the data, they compute some momentums and uh, whatnot. However, and there are people who do that in our company as well. Yeah, But usually, uh, what in the, let's say, in most projects where we do, we understand uh, the RDF formats as an interchange format. So we, I would say that um, what is nice about semantic web and about this RDF and all is that the semantics of data is very explicit in the data itself. So when you get a data set, you can already understand what is inside. And sometimes even some machines do. Yeah, if the if the if the links are, are really good, yeah. And then what we do, we just convert it to some other data structure that is more suitable for the use case. Got it. So you're basically converting RDFs to like traditional relational databases when needed. Not that much, but more into let's say objects uh, in in your uh, our favorite programming language or yeah, into and provide API uh, endpoints. Yeah. Got it. So for, for these kind of like the, uh, let's say commercial projects, right? Because even though they're government uh, related and European Union related, there's still uh, commercial projects, right? Or are those public projects? So they're, I mean, they're not really commercial. So we yeah, some of this development that we get there goes into the product. And then the other 95% uh, of the company, which is not the research team, they make uh, yeah, commercialize some of these results. But the research projects are basically, yeah, we don't make really money out of it. Got it. And in terms of uh, like 
practical end user applications um, that, that you guys are creating and without asking you to expose any like, um, you know, proprietary information or anything. Um, how do you expose the knowledge graphs to regular people? Because this is something that I'm um, kind of battling with in terms of we have researchers, medical researchers that have no clue what knowledge graphs are what semantic web is or linked data is, how do we present a, a usable interface for them to operate these structures? Um, may, may I, uh, Artem? <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah. of course. Okay, so there are two, uh, two ways for this. One of them is, let's say, we uh, kind of build ad hoc uh, stuff for this, right? So uh, we have in these research projects, we have a bunch of different uh, applications that we have developed, uh, some of them actually for question answering uh, and for other stuff. So I don't know, visualization, this kind of stuff. So this is kind of ad hoc stuff. Uh, we have Drupal integrations, uh, this kind of stuff that helps uh, yeah, make things easier. But the other one is, let's say our star product, what we actually, what the company sells. Uh, if um, I, I will share you quickly, I will share quickly the screen. Uh -huh. So uh, I will show you how this looks like. Okay, so what uh, you have here is um, the product that we sell is called Pool Party. And it's basically um, a user interface to manage, let's say, very small or rather small scale um, knowledge graphs. In this case, what we have here is a very small scale knowledge graph about proteins from SARS-CoV-2 uh, that was assembled by SciByte, Sci I think. It's a NLP processing company in the UK. So they assembled this list of proteins and they just uh, published it and we uh, imported here. Yeah, and what this uh, gives us here, it's, I mean, these are protein names. I have no idea what they mean, but a medical professional might or a biochemist, whatever, they they see here gene names probably. And then they have here uh, other alternative names for this. Yeah. Uh, in this, so this is just a quick example that I set up this morning that I had a quick chat with Slava actually about this. So we have this, uh, this is a very COVID specific um, uh, vocabulary and, uh, but we can load other vocabularies. And I think that some of the stuff that, um, so let's just to summarize quickly, a knowledge graph um, can be, we can talk of it in several, um, of several parts. One of them is, let's say the structure, kind of the schema of the uh, what you'd have as a schema in the, in the uh, relational database world, which is the ontology. Then you have a bunch of statements, which is the data, which is what you guys have. So every single one of these annotations that you have on the papers uh, can be a statement in this graph. Uh, but some of these statements um, talk about what we call controlled vocabularies. So uh, I think you guys are using, me are using mesh disease uh, and uh, add some other vocabulary I forgot right now. So these vocabularies are, let's say, fixed catalogs, what uh, in, the, in the relational database world they call catalogs or codes. And this tool that uh, I'm showing you is something to manage this last component. So to manage, let's say, the, the vocabularies. So right now, what this means is that this instance that you see here, maybe tomorrow somebody comes and says, yeah, there's a new protein. So if they just double click something here, uh, write down a new protein name and uh, afterwards some other application can use it. Uh, for example, the entity extraction uh, pipelines that you guys have or the metadata um, uh, or rather the faceted search, for example, from the dataverse that you guys have installed could also make use of this. So this, you know, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, that helps. So basically you kind of have a, a tree-based uh, user interface to, to visualize um, the hierarchies, what I see on the left. And mm -hmm. is there a way to actually browse the, <clears throat> the interconnections and the relationships? Um, no, so 
the short answer is no. This is only for the vocabularies which we think uh, which are usually hierarchical. If we want to have, let's say, more complex relationships, this is not supported, let's say, graphically. There's not, it's not something you can browse right here. Yeah. And what do you guys use for these kind of visualizations? Hmm. That's a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, Does something exist? Yeah, so we know of a couple. Um, yeah, maybe Artem knows more. So the first one I've seen that you guys also use comes embedded in GraphDB. So GraphDB is like a triple store where you can store the tri the, the knowledge graph. It has, um, I think, quite decent visualizer. The other one is from uh, from a competitor, which is uh, or had an open bot, an open source project or something like this called Ontodia. Uh, this is a JavaScript library that you can kind of customize, uh, yeah, to, to uh, let's say, visualize. Uh, let, let me show you what these guys have. Uh, yeah, I think hmm, hmm. I, I always have a, a difficult time looking at this. Yeah, where you can uh, kind of visualize how these um, yeah, knowledge graphs work. Um, I can, I, I think I have a bookmark somewhere. Yeah. Uh, this one is quite powerful, but it's, as, as I said, it turned, uh, it turned commercial, which means that now it can, uh, it's a bit out of, um, uh, it's a bit out of support and things are not so easy to maintain. And I don't know if, uh, ah, I, I think I found, it. Ah, no, it's actually broken. Let's see. No, here we can put it. Okay, this is their demo. Uh, yeah, this, yeah, and here you can put some entity. So here, for example, I put COVID-19 and you can see, uh, yeah, things that are like relationships that are um, connected to it. For example, for COVID-19, it has its cause of the pandemic and so on. And then you add this and you have, uh, yeah, kind of a graph nice. here. Yeah, uh, but yeah, this, I mean, this all, it's not perfect, but it's something. I don't know, Artem, if you think of something else. Uh, well, probably uh, a visual all could, could be an, another thing that is also open source. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, however, this is more suitable for visualizing, so to say, the schema, so the ontology behind the data and not the instances of the data. Yeah, this one cannot support, like if you have uh, more than, I don't know, 500 nodes, it crashes really quick. Yeah. Because it loads everything in memory at once. So. Yeah, makes sense. So um, actually, so I have a question. Um, you, Victor, you've observed this uh, kind of the Q&A uh, kickoff uh, session, and we're still at the very beginning of understanding how to tackle it um, in terms of like the, the NLP. But I was wondering if you guys have, from your experience with doing Q&A, some approach or maybe some papers to point us into um, in terms of the, the actual like traversing of the knowledge graph to be able to answer specific questions from the literature. Mm, okay, so yeah, I have two, a couple of answers to this. The first one is, um, there is some also some other product out there uh, which you might find interesting, which is called, uh, I think, QA, is it QA doc, Artem, the French one? Uh, no, it's a QA, Q answer. It's cool. Yeah, right, that's yeah. Q answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this one works directly on the knowledge graph. Yeah, so if you have a super cool knowledge graph, in theory, Q answer can find uh, stuff, uh, your uh, answers there, but building this knowledge graph is, yeah, it's really, really hard. Yeah, maybe in, in the better future, it will be like this. Um, that's one thing now, uh, because you mentioned traversing the knowledge graph. What we do right now uh, for QA, there are approaches, the, which is the deliverable that I linked to you the other day. Basically, we have a bunch of documents where we want to look for the answers. Yeah, and then we use um, two, let's say two steps. The first one is to uh, pre-select a, a handful of these documents. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, a hundred or so 
or maybe less of these documents. And we use that with some, let's say, sophisticated um, Elasticsearch queries. So we have some tricks that the user uh, writes down a, qu a question. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, turned into one or a couple of Elasticsearch queries, and then a bunch of documents come where maybe the answer is, right? And then the this is really not the rocket science, it's really simple. And then the other one, this one uh, is uses the, let's say, state-of-the-art uh, language models and this kind of stuff. So uh, BERT, that I think you guys mm -hmm. also have uh, experience with, to find in these articles or more specifically in these text snippets, yeah. so let's say paragraph by paragraph, to find the span, so the sentence, let's say, in this paragraph uh, that may, um, might contain the answer. Yeah. And this, yeah, we do with some uh, already available models which are out there uh, from uh, yeah, the ones that we are using right now are in the hugging face uh, library. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. have. Yeah, so yeah, in the in the hugging face library, there's already some stuff for uh, some models trained on Squath actually. So you can use these models directly to take a bunch of snippets, a question, and it points you to possible answers and scores them. Got it. So a small note from my side. So on the first topic that Victor has mentioned, uh, this Q answer, this is a kind of uh, area, let's say in semantic web that we call question answering over link data that is trying to find an answer inside knowledge graph. Yeah. This is not really the use case that we are discussing, but since Victor touched it already, I just put two more links. Uh, Actually, and since I'm very far from understanding the details of it, but it, makes sense to me that you can combine the approach of finding the answer and the, the actual knowledge graph was finding an answer in kind of the high level uh, search, um, like the, the, the embeddings created by Cybird or Bird or any other language models. And I was wondering if you guys ever experienced any kind of like hybrid model that uh, uses both approaches. Yeah, okay, so as a quick question, as a answer, yes, we have some kind of use of the knowledge graph in this step, first in the step of generating queries and of making the queries to the Elasticsearch better. So the Elasticsearch doesn't just index the whole text, but it index the text with some entities that have been identified in them. Right? Yeah. And then when you search, you also add entities. And since you have further information about these entities, for example, synonyms or related entities, I don't know, genes from where the proteins come from, whatever, then you can enrich this query. That's uh, one thing, the query enrichment. Uh, and this, this uh, let's say, definitely, um, or yeah, that does give some improvement uh, on, on finding better documents on how to do this. And the other one that we have, um, I mean, it's more or less similar, is that instead of searching for the documents themselves, instead of indexing the documents, one can create a kind of a fingerprint of the documents, which is, let's say, for every document, you have a list of entities that were found in this. Yeah, so instead of doing a full text search, you kind of search into the graph. Yeah, so if you have a graph like you guys do of a document surrounded by the entities that it, uh, that it mentions, and then you get a question that mentions some entities, you kind of look for the subgraph that contains this. Um, that matches uh, what the question was, uh, or the subgraphs. There are possi many possible such documents, and then you do uh, you take the documents there and you analyze them using the BERT. Or, yeah. Got it. And are there any kind of like, um, I don't know, some benchmarks or um, some data sets for this particular exercise? Or is this like cutting edge research at, at this point? Hmm. I don't know. I think the best uh, benchmarks are them stop me is the ones that we have, or the only ones are the ones that we have produced for links. The only ones that we have uh, for this uh, using the knowledge graph, or do you know any other? 
Uh, I mean, even this is not a benchmark. <laughs> so I don't know any because what we have in links is, uh, is quite small. Yeah, it's like a handful of questions. Yeah, yeah. So I would not call it. A Got it. Um, well, it's it's definitely an interesting topic, and even in terms of the the research itself. Um, but uh, would you guys be interested in participating in uh, in the calls for Q and A um, team to to see if there is this uh, connection between the traditional kind of NLP. Um, uh, approaches and the the searches over linked data because uh, obviously not many people actually have experience with that and I believe you guys are probably the our best shot to to get some more knowledge um, in in that um, area <clears throat> but yeah if if you can join for like 30 minute calls occasionally um, that would be a, a great addition to our initiative yeah, I would be happy to join uh, yeah, and give some advice and share some knowledge. And also some of the services that we have developed for these projects, they have to be, I mean, they are in theory released under some uh, free license, European free license, whatever. And yeah, I can also assist in deploying at least the simplest of these. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah. And what do you guys uh, like? Obviously, there has to be a, a both-way relationship, right? You guys are not just interested in um, like enriching uh, our services, but also enriching uh, your existing knowledge base and research uh, initiatives. I mean, is, is this something that looks interesting to you in terms of is there something that you, put, you can potentially, uh, I don't know, in, innovate internally? I just want to make sure that we're actually creating an environment where you would be interested in in this. Okay, uh, Victor, if you if you if you would like to say, go, go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, we are interested in that. Uh, so I will say that our interest in the first place, I would put the research interest. That means that the task is interesting, and if we can contribute to society, this is great. Uh, this is part of it. Another big part of it is making new connections. So we believe if we work together with people on any small project, then that is more likely that in, in future we will have a larger project. Yeah. So this is one side. And another side is that if something uh, useful comes out of it, something, especially if it's something, let's say, tangible in, in terms of, I don't know, software methods, software tooling, Docker Compose that composes the services together, we would, of course, very be very glad to make this public that we participated in this. So to, let's say, marketing. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, there are a lot of teams in CoronaWide that are already writing papers and kind of um, getting into different publications and, and conferences. So maybe that's also something that we can collaborate on and write this uh, a giant uh, collaborative paper. Yeah, that would be totally great. Awesome. All right. I mean, I'm super excited. Um, I don't have any other questions unless you guys have. Mm, yeah. Uh, when is the next call? And if you have some sort of, uh, uh, let's say, roadmap in this direction in mind. So we took some time this week to establish Trello board and kind of like organize the internal uh, kitchen of things. I'm planning to uh, kick off the organization-wide calls uh, probably today, which means we'll have a more, uh, like if you remember back in April, we used to have these daily calls where all teams would come and share what they're working on. Um, unfortunately, we lost that habit and somehow all the communications went into DMs and private channels, which is kind of, uh, you know, we lost the purpose of the collaboration because no one really knows what's happening. So we're pulling teams out of the DMs right now and trying to recreate more open environment as it was in, back in April, May. Um, I'll make sure to invite you guys to the next call. Most probably it will be Friday. I think so. Um, but let's see. Um, I'm not really sure yet because <clears throat> I want to make sure that we first establish the organization-wide uh, synchronization and then get, get into the team-wide syncs. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, also from our side, I think that tackling this particular Q&A challenge is, uh, yeah, we can benefit from it uh, get, to get more experience because it's an amazing data set. Uh, so we are, we are happy to uh, yeah, try, try it, try our best on it. And very ambiguous questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I'm uh, super happy that we connected. Uh, it was nice meeting you, Artem. And um, do you guys, uh, Artem, do, do you want to join our Slack maybe? So we're in... in join, pardon, what join? Uh, Corona Y Slack. Slack. Ah, yeah. 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 You can just fill out the, the coronawai.org uh, form uh, on the website and you'll receive the invite. Okay, cool. Cool. Awesome. I'll also, add you to uh, team COVID questions that the channel where this, this particular initiative is going on. Okay. Thanks a lot. And from our, from my side, it's nice to meet you, Arthur. And it's really, it's a nice opportunity for us that we can spend relatively little effort and still participate and hopefully contribute to your efforts. So thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome and thanks for, for willing and having intent for that. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. You too. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.